wonderful. We are here again. Good morning, our friends um, who ensure that every morning, every Tuesday morning, you are with us for Pastor's Corner. We are delighted to know that you are there with us. Um, and I'm happy to be here with you for another Pastor's Corner. Um, good morning, Sister Alicia and others who are joining us for yet another Pastor's Corner. We are here this, this morning. Um, looking at difficult Bible passages. And by the way, we'll give you an opportunity to put in the chat. Um, we'll invite you to put some passages that has become very difficult for you. And we would not be responding to them today. But I'll take note of them so that um, when we're having another pastor's corner with difficult Bible passages, um, we can look into them. But this morning, that's what we're looking at, difficult Bible passages. Um, and I have two able guests here with me, um, two young professors, I would say, one, one, you know, um, you know, I, 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 I know you love to hear from them. They are no strangers and pastors corner. So I, I, you'll have a treat in some of the passages that we will discuss. So let's have a word of prayer. Then I'll introduce the guests and we'll get right into, um, today's, today's program. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your goodness. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be here at another pastor's corner. And I pray, Lord, that the program today will be a blessing to all our listeners and viewers throughout our viewership. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ferguson, good morning. Good morning. So, um, <clears throat> with me today are two of my colleagues. Um, to my far left, we have Pastor Jerry Vincent. Pastor amen, Vincent amen. is the pastor of the Southwestern District, um, the churches of Grand Roy, Concord, Bushishu, Mount Morris. Of course, Grand, Grand Mall is also in that district. And Pastor Vincent is getting ready to, um, actually, he's getting ready to um, go and preach the everlasting gospel in a, uh, at an evangelistic meeting over there in Black Bay. Um, Pastor Vincent, how are plans going? It's going well. It's going well. We're ready to go. All right. So I, 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 and I, I can only suspect that some difficult Bible passages might be answered, <laughs> questions might be answered there during the series. Thank you for being on Pastor's Corner this morning. And to my immediate left, we have the young, ever-vescent pastor, Pastor Stephen Francois, who is now the pastor of the South Central District with churches of um, St. Paul's, Bolio, and New Hampshire. Of course, um, Windsor Forest is also part of that district, but it's not under his jurisdiction. Welcome, Pastor Francois. Thank you, Pastor Isaac. Uh, wonderful. It's good to have you here in Pastor's Corner. So, um, <coughs> we, we are here for another Pastor's Corner, and um, it's always a wonderful feeling to be here to share with you. And there are some difficult Bible passages that we're seeking to get some answers for. I'm saying even from now, you, if <clears throat> as we go through the program, uh, if, you in, if you notice that one of your, your difficult Bible passage is not one of those in which we are dealing with, you can place them in the chat. It will not be responded to today because we have to go and prepare for it to ensure we give you correct answers. But at another pastor's corner, under the caption, difficult Bible passages, they will be responded to. So question number one, my guess, um, do you agree that Jesus showed partiality and discriminated against certain groups of people? If not, how would you explain Matthew 15 and verse 26? The question is, I mean, do you agree? There are some persons who are saying that Jesus showed partiality, you know, and Jesus discriminated against certain people groups um do you do you agree with that and 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 if you if if you do or if you if you don't then how do you explain uh, matthew 15 and verse 26 so let's let me get matthew 15 26 and i'll read it and then um, you both shall respond the word of god says and he answered and said that's referring to jesus and he answered and said it is not meat to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. This is a, res a request from a woman that Jesus did something for her. 
And Jesus responded and saying, it's not right to take what's belonging to the children and give it to dogs. Was Jesus referring to people, a certain category of person as dogs? Pastors, help us. Um, Pastor, it's a good question. And I'm at, at face value, and one can say that Jesus is being disrespectful. However, we know that we serve a loving God, True. and that um, Jesus is a faithful God. And here, if you look at the back, if you read the background of the text and so forth, and even the previous verses from chapter 15, verse, um, verse 1, you would recognize that Jesus was in Jerusalem, Pastor. However, after he finished his discourse in Jerusalem, he traveled some 40 plus miles to go to Tyre and Sidon. Mm -hmm. So imagine Jesus is walking 40 miles, have walked 40 miles. And when he reached there, he met this, this, this young lady. Um, and she had an issue. And upon, upon reaching there, uh, she, 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 she went to Jesus so that Jesus can, can solve her problem, that her daughter was demon-possessed. And she came to Jesus, asking Jesus, pleading to Jesus, help me, because my daughter is possessed. And one thing that we need to understand, these Sidonians and those people that were living in Tyre, um, they were not Jews, they were not Israelites, and therefore they were considered, considered rather, as dogs to the Jewish nation. They so were considered just, unimportant. So just clarify, they, they were considered as dogs by Jesus? No, by the Jewish nation. Okay, okay. Yes, and, and therefore, she, when she come to Jesus, Jesus, she asked Jesus, and Jesus was saying, um, in verse 26, it is not good for, to take the children's bread and throw to little dogs. So Jesus is saying, it is not right to take the children or Israelites healing and give a foreigner and give a heathen. And, and Jesus was speaking the language that she understood and that his disciples also understood. But if you read the Bible, you'd understand that when she said that, yes, Lord, she said, I understand that, Lord. I understand what you are saying. But just even the little dogs eat the scrums of the table of them of their masters and jesus said unto her o grew o woman great is thy feet let it be to you as you desire so we can see jesus is just saying we shall not take the children bread and give to little dogs gee when jesus said little dogs he was cushioning the blow in which that they were being labeled and and and, and, we, and we can see that jesus is showing love to that young lady to that woman by saying little dogs, because little puppies are more acceptable to the master's table than big dogs who have to go and fend to themselves. And so therefore, Jesus was not calling her, but Jesus was using that language in which she understood, and which the disciples also understood. And therefore, Jesus grant her her desire in, in a test of faith, and her, because of her persistency, she received her healing, and praised God for Jesus today. Okay, Pastor Vincent, you want to add something to that? The Bible says, uh, Matthew 5, 45, he maketh his, his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. God has no favorites. So th that's why I believe this text is so confusing to some. But we must remember that Jesus was speaking basically uh, bringing out a lesson to his disciples because they believed that if you were not a Jew or an Israelite they considered everybody else Gentiles or even the word dogs so Jesus wanted the disciples to understand that in his eyes in God's eyes we are all equal we are all deserving of the master's blessing. Okay. Now, when you're speaking to the woman, the woman understood that the Jews looked at them, Canaanites, as dogs. So, so when Jesus made the statement to her, she understood what he was saying. Yeah? But I guess uh, nobody expected her reply. Yeah? Basically, what she said was that, yes, Lord, E e e even though the, the Jews are the chosen people, but even, even in the household of the chosen people, the dogs are 
are even fed from the master's table. So even though they may be uh, the chosen people, we, are, we can also be favored because we are what is known as we eat, we eat from the master's table. The, the what? What's the word it is? The meat from the master's table. Okay. And, and so, so and, and, and Pastor, the question was, is Jesus showing partiality? So Jesus was not showing partiality. None at all. None at all. In, that, in, in dealing with that woman. He was testing of it. And as my colleague said, that he was, actu he was actually uh, presenting a principle and letting also his disciples know that, hey, the, the, pre the wall of prejudice should be broken down. Broken down. Okay. Right. So right. we're establishing that Jesus is not prejudicial at all. Jesus is very impartial in the way he, he does his way he did his ministry and way, the way he functions today. Um, and we who are called Christians should not then take a different route. If Jesus, we should be following the footsteps of Jesus. Um, when, as was said, when Jesus responded to that, he was using the language of what was expected yeah, during the time. time yeah. Um, if Jesus was impartial, if Jesus, was, um, if Jesus showed partiality, he would not then proceed to grant the favor. But just a few texts down, we saw that Jesus actually granted the favor. So, yes, he, he used the term that was used, customary, for disciples to understand this is what you call persons, but I am not for it. And therefore, that's why he proceeded to give the blessing um, to the, the lady as Amen. she indicated. Yes. This is uh, Stephen saying, very confusing. When others argue with this scripture, they stress on the fact that Jesus called her a dog and she even recognized it. And so if Jesus did it, we can do it as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, context determines meaning. In the context, yeah. Yes, context determines meaning. Um, you know, we, we have to, when something is written, we have to understand the context in which it was written. Yes? Otherwise, we would never get the, the, the understanding. So, words should not be taken for face value. Words should never be taken for face value. You never get the real meaning of a, of a word when it is extracted from the context. Yeah? So, um, no. If persons using this as an example to say that Jesus did it, I can do it. No. Wrong. Wrong. Wrong response. Um, they don't have it right. Uh, so we're moving on. We're moving on. Um, question number two, pastors. It has been said on many occasions that the soul is not a living entity outside of the body. Yes, we've said that many times. If that is to be accepted, how would you explain 1 Kings 17, 21, and 22? Yes? Mm -hmm. So let me restate. It has been said on many occasions that the soul is not a living entity outside of the body. If that is to be accepted, how then would you explain 1 Kings 17, 21 and 22? So I would read 1 Kings 17, 21 and 22. It says, and he, referring to Elijah, and he stretched himself upon the child three times. And cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. So, so, so pastors, that, that is quite a passage of scripture there. We're wow. told that the soul is not something... That lives outside of the body. You know? We, we were told that. Um, I believe that. But, but, but this text, here the text is telling us that Elijah the prophet prayed and asked God for the soul of the child to come into him again. And he prayed. And then the, the soul of the child came into him again and the child came back to life. Help, pastors, help us, help um, us. Pastor, it's a good question, and the, uh, since the theme is difficult Bible passages, I will try, I will try my best um, to navigate as we um, continue our program this morning. Um, Elijah here um, went to this woman, this widow of Zarephath. She took care of Elijah. She fed him, 
And here, her child got sick and her child died. And Elijah now praying in the upper room, stretching on this woman's child and asking God to allow the soul, the soul of the, the child, soul of the child to return. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems as though that the child have a soul. And the soul left. And the soul left. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the if we go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, and the, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now, when you look at Elijah's statement or Elijah's prayer and pleading to God, one can build, one can try to build a doctrine on that pastor and say that man have a soul and man is not a soul. Mm -hmm. But here the Bible is saying that man is. Man became a living soul when God breathed the breath of life into his nostril. And to understand Elijah, the context which Elijah was speaking to, we have to do some word story. And therefore, the, the, the word soul in Hebrew mean, is nefesh, which means breath or life. So Elijah was actually saying, Lord, permit the breath of life to come back into the boys into into the boy so that he can live again and not just man ham the boy calling for a soul no 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 elijah is saying lord allow this child to receive the breath of life from you so that he can live again so man is not man does not have a soul the bible tells us in in genesis 2 7 that man is a living soul pastor okay pastor vince you want to add something to that yes i do you know uh I love the King James Bible, but I also have other versions of the Bible. And if you, for this verse, if you look at all the other versions, the word life is used. Now, in, in place of soul. In place of soul. Okay. Now, uh, I per honestly believe that when the text says child soul, they basically meant life. And I'm not sure whether the word soul in the time when the, this Bible was written, uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was the word life was used, soul was used as the word life as well. It, it could have been, but uh, as we can see, all the versions use the word life. And as my colleague had said, the word nefesh, uh, which means life. When you go back to the original language, which is Hebrew, let me see, yeah, Hebrew, the word is life. Okay. His life. All right. Yeah. So, so we, um, we have to be very clear. I think we, we, we are very clear, as Pastor Francois even said it, that, that man is a soul because when God created man according to, according to Genesis 2 7, man was there. Then God breathed into man. Yeah? The bread of life. The bread of life. And then. Man became a living soul when the breath of life was placed within him by God. Yeah? So if the widow's son died, it meant that that breath of life left him. That breath of life which God gave in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 that caused Adam to be a living soul. That breath left the child. So when the prophet Elijah prayed, the prophet Elijah was praying and asking God to return that bread, that knee flesh. Although the word soul is used in the King James, but the original word is knee flesh, which meant life or living soul. So he prayed that the life, the bread of life, comes back to the child so the child could be a living soul. So the soul, we agree, is not a living entity. You know, that so we three are sitting here and we are three living souls. We cannot sit here and our soul can live and go. And, and, and what is some people refer to as astral travel. It travels, it goes, to, you know, it goes to, to, to London to meet a friend and talk with a friend and then return unto you. No, no, no. No, no, the Bible does not teach that. Um, the, the soul, this is a soul. There isn't something within me that is called a soul. This is a soul. This is a soul. And we all, um, yes, right? So, so this is how we have to interpret this qu question. Man is a living soul. That's correct, Sister, Sister Stephen. Man is indeed a living soul. So there should be no confusion 
there should be no confusion concerning um, what that meant. Um, we, we're moving on. We're moving on. Quite, quite interested. You can uh, make your comments. We enjoy your comments. You can ask your questions for clarity um, as we continue. We move on to um, <coughs> question, question three, which is why does your church teach only Jesus can forgive sins? question is asking us, why do we teach only Jesus can forgive sins? Didn't Jesus also give such power to the church before he left or not? So the question is saying, why do we teach, Pastor Francois and Vincent, why do we teach that, that only Jesus can forgive sins? Didn't Jesus give some powers to forgive sins to the church before he left? And the person is quoting um, John 20 and verse 23. So, um, let, let's see what, what John 20, 23 says. Um, they, they're alluding to the fact, is it a fact? They, they're alluding <laughs> to the notion um, that Jesus um, has given power to forgive sins. So let's see. So I'll read John 20 and verse, and verse 23. And let's see what it says. Um, the word of God says, John 20, 23. Whosoever sins he remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins he retain, they are retained. Wow, what, what is this saying? That is Jesus speaking, direct words from Jesus. <laughs> we don't want to say when it's written in red, it's actual words of Jesus. Jesus is saying to his disciples, um, hey, whoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Does the church, the question is, does the church have some powers along with Jesus to forgive sins? This text proves that? Um, Help us. As face value, Pastor it may, we some may assume that um, Christ has given Pastor Francois to forgive you, the power to forgive you. And when you commit a sin, however, the Bible, the Bible may say something, but we have to find out what it means. Mm -hmm. Um, after telling the disciples to receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus sent, sends the disciples to continue his ministry to preach the everlasting gospel. And those uh, that hear of Jesus through them, whether directly or indirectly, as El Pastor Vincent is, um, will commence his evangelistic series. So as he preached indirectly or directly, we will have the opportunity or individuals will have the opportunity to repent of their sins and receive God's forgiveness. It is important to note that this verse convey its thoughts in a figurative speech known as metonymy. That is, the action of forgiveness is put for the proclamation of it. In other words, the apostles could confirm forgiveness due to its message. So therefore, uh, the, 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 the apostles cannot forgive sin, but through the preaching of the gospel, others would hear God's voice speaking to them, and through the gospel, they can get forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. And that is important. Um, and that is important for even for us today. By preaching of the word of God, others can repent, and others can receive forgiveness, not by the proclaimer, but the one who is being proclaimed. Um, Jesus did not give the apostles the inherent right to forgive sin, but the privilege to convey the message of forgiveness. So Jesus didn't say, you know what, Peter, James, and John, I'm giving you the, uh, he didn't, I, I'm, I'm not giving you, he didn't give them the opportunity to forgive sin, no. He gave them the privilege of, of conveying the message of forgiveness. So, Pastor, I can tell you, you can go to Jesus and you can receive your forgiveness. Okay, wonderful. Pastor Vince, you want to add something to that? The apostle said, if we confess our sin, we will. Did he say we will? What is it? He is faithful. He will. And who is the he? That's God. That's God. Yeah? It's God. Now, the authority bestowed on the church by Christ to forgive or not to forgive is the authority to preach the gospel and to decide who can or cannot be baptized. 
It is a tremendous responsibility that should not be taken lightly. An example is that I'm doing a Bible study with somebody. And I read this text to him. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. And he says, well, I want to confess my sin yeah, to you, Pastor. I say to him, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. You need to confess your sins to Jesus. Amen. And we sit down, we pray together, we pray. He, 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 he asks Jesus for forgiveness. And his forgiveness is accepted. Amen. Okay. So you know? in other words, Pastor, ministers of the gospel cannot forgive sin. But direct people to Jesus who can forgive sin. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So I think that is, um, we have to be very clear on that. No. There, there is a theology on that. Um, you know that the, that Jesus gave a church, has given the church, a Christian church, the authority to forgive sins, and that's that's a theology. It actually, you know, is intact. They believe that. Um, but if that that's the case, it means, <laughs> you know, it's a very treacherous ground to to tread because that that being the case, it means that. A group of men, you know, can decide, I don't like sister, I don't like pastor, um, I don't like this person, I'm not forgiving the sin. Yeah? A group of men can sit and decide that. And if that be the case, by an action of a group of persons, church leaders, lots of persons are going to help. Just think about it. Yeah? Because... If they don't like you, if, if, if what is taken in John 20 and verse 23 meant that the church has such power, a group of men can meet in a meeting room and decide, no, this group of people are not going to heaven. They are not going to heaven. So, no forgiveness for you. No. Thank God it's not that way. <laughs> I'm saying thank God it's not that way. The church has some authority. Jesus has given the church authority. The, the authority of the church to preach the everlasting gospel. And that's why we shouldn't take it lightly. Because, <clears throat> as we normally say, God has no hands but ours. Um, so we have, the church has the authority to preach the everlasting gospel. The church has the authority for discipline. Disciplinary action. Because we are acting on behalf of Jesus. The church has that authority. Yes, so the church can discipline persons. Because Jesus has given the church that authority. Yeah. But the church was not given the authority to forgive sins. That only remains with Jesus, who is God. Yes? Um, and that would never change. The word, that would never change. Um, so it's just understanding. We just, it's just understanding. God was too, put it a human way, God was too smart, <laughs> too intelligent, to not to allow human beings to be in charge of other human beings' salvation. Because when we get vexed with people, we say, hell for you. Hell, 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 hell. <laughs> Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so, God, God, God was so smart. All right. All right. We're moving on. We're moving on clearly. Um, yeah, we're moving on. Doesn't the Bible clearly teach? No, that's a very interesting one, pastors. Well, Lord, that's a very interesting one. Doesn't the Bible clearly teach that Christians can eat whatever food they had desire? If not, please comment on First Timothy 4 and verse 4. Wow. A statement. Doesn't the Bible teach that Christians can eat whatever their hearts desire? If that is not so, then please, they're asking you to comment upon 1 Timothy 4 um, and verse 4. So, let's see what it says. 1 Timothy 4, 4 says what? For every creature of God is good. And nothing to be refused. If it is received with thanksgiving. Every creature of God. Pastor Francois. Pastor Vincent. Every creature of God. There are proponents. <coughs> persons who um, purport that this text is saying. Every creature. Sheep. Goat. Snake, lizard, millipede, frogs, whatever it is. Every creature of God is good, and you can eat it once you have prayed and offered it with thanksgiving. What? what, what, what? 
What is this sex aid, Pastor? Pastor, you're asking me a difficult passage. Is it team this morning difficult Bible passages? Yes, yes that's wow. right. Very, wow, wow. Very very Not to understand Bible. what Paul is saying here, we have to go, we have to go back a little. Um, starting from verse 1, so 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time, some will depart from the feet. They will depart from the feet. The reason, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So they accept, Pastor, um, the deceitful nature of evil spirits. And they become demon-possessed. Mm -hmm. Doctrines of demons. Not doctrines from the Bible, brethren, of demons. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking lies in hypocrisy. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That means they have no feelings. They have no love. No, no, no compassion. And, what they, and listen what they are doing. Demon possess people. They have left the feet, left the doctrine. Well, listen what they are saying. Forbidding to marry <clears throat> and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. That's a good word. Mm -hmm. Pastor, there, there were some folks during Paul's time who were narcissists. And they believe that everything is matter. So, you, Pastor Vincent, you are, you are made of matter. Pastor Isaac, you are made of matter. And they believe that matter is evil. So the chair that you are sitting on, um, Sister Carter is evil. Sister Stephen, um, who online, uh, they, where you're sitting on probably, they believe that is matter. They are evil. It is evil. Everything around them is evil. And therefore, they believe since matter is evil, divorce says forbidding to marry. If you are marrying somebody, that is an evil practice. So, Pastor, they are saying that you are marrying an evil woman. God forbid. Sister Isaac is not evil. You understand? They must be good then. Have so, mercy. <laughs> so, that is, what, that, 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 that is the notion, that is the idea that they have. Since everything is evil, they are forbidding people to marry. And not just people, they are also saying if you eat food, the food that you eat, it is evil. Brethren, and these folks, and Paul was addressing that issue in those times. But Paul was saying here that for every creature of God is good. So Paul is saying that based on what they are saying, they are saying marrying someone is evil. It's an evil practice. Eating clean, eating good foods, it, 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 it's evil. That is what they are saying. So since Paul is saying, they are, based on what they are saying, Paul is saying, for every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is re received rather with thanksgiving or with prayer and thanksgiving. And therefore, some people run with that text and say you can eat crab. Not understanding, you can eat manicure pasta. You can eat frog. You can eat snakes. Many people run with that and say, okay, well, this text proves. But Paul, this Paul was referring to what they are saying in regards. Paul was saying, for every creature of God is good. So, in other words, God created. They were saying marriage is not good. But Paul saying, God created that. So marriage is good. That what is, that what is Paul is that what Paul is addressing. It. They say marriage is evil because matter is evil and the husband that you have is evil and the wife that you have is evil. Paul is saying, for everything that God has created, God has created, for every creature of God is good. So God created me and I am good. But they are saying, no, you are evil because you are matter. And nothing is to be received, refused rather. So the food that, 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 that they are saying evil, Paul is saying, no, 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 no. God created each and every one of us, God created creatures are good. And therefore, since God created them, it is good. But some, some folks are saying they are talking about food. No, we're not talking about that. Paul was talking about based on what they are saying. People who are demon possessed that were going with a, with a false doctrine, who are narcissists that are going wrong, that will be going wrong, and have been going wrong and preaching those doctrines. Wow, deep word, Pastor Francois. Pastor Vincent, you want to share something with us before we go for a break? We yeah, do that shortly. I would just like to break down verse 3 where it says, Forbidden to marry and commanded to abstain from meat. Then the next point is, Aww. 
which God has created to be received with thanksgiving. They were forbidding people to marry, commanding to abstain from meats or foods, which God himself had created to be received with thanksgiving. In other words, there, the, the, when he says, uh, for verse one, he says, every creature, is, is create, is, every creature of God is good. Yeah? Good for what? What purpose? What purpose were these things good for? So, so and the verse one went on to say, if it's received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, you have to determine that marriage was sanctified by the word of God. Amen. That's right. Good yeah? point. Good point. Certain Richard. foods were sanctified but by the word of God. Not all foods. Some foods were unclean. Some were clean. Yeah, so, uh, but they were saying everything. Yeah? Okay. Forbidding you to marry. Commanding to abstain from all meats. Because why? They are evil. All right. So, so folks, you know, um, to, to understand verse 4, as, as was clearly articulated by Pastor, both Pastor Francois and now Pastor um, Vincent, you, you can't just accept verse 4 for every creature of God. You need to have read the context of that passage. Yeah. And, and to begin with, no, notice who notice who is proposing that kind of teaching. Persons who have departed from the faith, yeah? And they have given into seducing spirits. So, so the, what we're reading from verse 2 and verse 3 and 4 is really purported by persons who, who are listening to evil spirits. You know? <laughs> yeah. So if someone is listening to evil spirits, obviously their doctrine itself will be evil. True. You see? So that's the first thing we have to get. And then as Pastor Francois rightly said, we got on to the Apostle Paul is then saying what actually they were purporting. They were suggesting that, as was said, matter is evil. And we were created from, the Bible says that God created Adam from the dust of the ground. He took a rib from Adam and created Eve. So, so matter is evil. evil. That's, so that's the belief. The Gnostics believe that. And therefore, it's matter came from the ground and woman came from man. Woman is evil. So they believe that marriage was evil. And Paul was saying, how could marriage be evil when God already said in, in um, Hebrews 34 that, that marriage is honorable and the bed is on the fire? How can foods, not necessarily meat, how can foods be evil when God already indicated what, is, what, should, what should we eat and what we shouldn't eat? So that is the context of that passage. And um, when Paul says every creature of God is really, the rendering should be every creation of God, God is good. good. That is, marriage is good. And foods that were already <coughs> blessed by God, yeah. it is blessed. The Amen. text is not suggesting that you can take something that God didn't bless and bless it and it becomes good. No, we do not have such power. God had, did not give us such, that power that you have authority. There are some persons who go around the world saying, yeah, we have the power. We just pray. And bless it. I, I'm not sure where that power comes from, but God has not given us such power. Wonderful gentlemen, we're doing well. But at this time, we'll pause, we'll pause, and we'll take a break and, and bless your heart with a, a special item of music. Looking for answers, you need a way out. You've been trapped in that trial, full of sorrow and doubt. You saw a trickle of sunlight, but you found no escape. Just hold on to his promises. He said he'll make a way. Yeah. 
trust that you were blessed by the words of that song. May God bless your heart as we continue to on this pastor's program. We have been studying if you just joined us. Difficult Bible passages. There are some passages which, which is difficult and some they are similarly difficult. Very. But but um, we are here to um, bring clarity. And I say we as in Pastor Francois and Pastor Vincent are here to bring clarity to you. So if you just join us, we, that's what we've been looking at this morning, a few difficult Bible passages, just in case, as I've said earlier on. Um, if, you, if you have a passage of Scripture which has been tormenting your mind and hasn't <coughs> gotten a true understanding of it, you can drop it in the chat and at some other program, not the next program, the next time we are doing difficult Bible passages, we'll ensure that we look at that passage of scripture that, um, that you would have submitted. So, we're moving on, we're continuing. Um, according to 1 Timothy, pastors, according to 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, should women be allowed to speak in church? According to some of our ladies, <laughs> some of you ladies, um, on our a regular pastor's corner. Uh, uh -huh. Shall, should you be allowed to speak in church? <laughs> That's the question. And the folks are quoting the Bible on that. So let me read it for you, pastors. First Timothy 2, 11. The word of God says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach. I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man. 
but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. According to this passage, according to this passage, is it wrong to allow women to speak in church? Um, so we have to go back to the culture of the, of the time in which Paul was speaking of. The culture. Tell us about the culture, the culture Pastor Francis. Um, it's an interesting um, passage of scripture. Um, some folks, um, I remember in church, heated argument regarding women's silence in church, Pastor. Mm -hmm. um, back then, I didn't fully understand, but um, now I, I, I come a little closer. Wait, hold on. To so, the understanding. Hold on, hold on. So back then, you believed that women should not speak in church? <laughs> no, I didn't understand back then. Oh, you didn't I, understand. I didn't confirm my belief, but I believe in it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right. Yeah, and back then, in um, the Jewish culture, um, the most educated sector was of the men. So the men were, were going to the synagogue and the different places, and they were well-versed and educated as it relates to scripture, the laws, and the Bible, and so forth. And therefore, when you read through the Bible, you understand that the lawyers will come to them, Jesus, the doctors, and all of them is, was male figures. Pastor Isaac, who I, was, I never heard of a, a female figure, a female lawyer, or a female doctor coming to Jesus. So predominantly, the, the most educated individuals were, the, were the, most of the males. And so therefore, the woman in that culture, the woman was the one that would stay home and take care of the children, take care of the house. Not in today's society where both um, part of the, of, 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 of the spectrum, the male and the female, they work and, and people are well versed in ed well, Women are now versed in education and being educated now. But back then, it wasn't so. And therefore, since the men were the most educated sect of those times, Paul was saying, um, because the woman and the women are not educated as it relates to being able to teach um, in an in a, in a, in a, um, intelligent way, Paul is saying, um, don't, don't permit them not to, not to speak because they can, they can say things to lead the church astray. So to God, that, that, that nature of leading, being led astray, Paul is cautioning the, 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 the ladies at that time to remain silent or, or don't say anything. And that was like Paul said, he said, learn in silence. So in other words, Paul is saying, you're in your silence, you will learn. And I think we forget that that part of the text was say learn in silence. So, yes, they are, not, they, are not, they are not highly educated, I would say, but Paul is encouraging them to learn in silence. And as a result of a learning in silence, you would gain the wisdom that which God have for you. Okay. Pastor Vince, you want to add something to that, Pastor? This church was built on Bible study. We read a text of Scripture... We don't just take it at face value. This is what he's saying. We research the text. Do like the Berians to see if it is so. We spend time studying. It's important to know the background and culture of the text that we are reading. For us to get a clearer understanding of what the Bible is saying to us. Now... I have heard, one of, the st one of my studies I've looked at is that in the, in the synagogues, men would sit over there, women would sit over there. It, it, it is said that in certain cultures, women were like property. Yeah? The men had the privilege to buy and sell, to own. The women did not have that kind of power. So, I guess access to the, to the Bible and the Word of God was predominantly the male who did the, mostly the studying and, and education was not a thing uh, that was, I won't say allowed to women, but women, that, that was not for them in certain times. So, you find the men did the study and, and, and the scriptures and, and I, I guess it, it is said that when they were studying the synagogue, the women would shout across to their husband to find, well what's this what's, what is saying what has been said here what is this about and it can be very noisy 
and, and it can disturb the peace. But I don't think where it says be silent in the church, the, the word silent is not talking about don't talk. Yeah? It means it's talking about have, have some order. Yeah? More peaceful, quietness. But it's not saying you're not allowed to, to say this or say this or talk. Okay. Yeah? But you don't want the church, the church is a, is a church of order. You don't, it, it can turn into chaos. All right. If everybody's talking all at once. So I think we are agreeing that the Apostle Paul, there are some persons even today, are using this passage to suggest um, that the Apostle Paul gave instructions that women should not speak in church. And when we allow women to speak in church, we are going contrary to the word of God. But we, ha we are now being reminded or instructed that context, Pastor Franz, will always determine meaning. If you don't have the correct context, you'll never arrive to the correct meaning. And of course, as Pastor Vincent rightly just said, what was happening there? How the sanctuary was arranged? Well, even today, um, you know, in, in the... In the in the, in the Muslim culture, well, women not even allowed, um, much less to be sitting. But the, the husbands, the males would have been sitting over here, there, the women sit over here. And then a passage has been discussed. And the women gets up and makes some statements about it and, and, and the apostle Paul, you see that? That is, so for a proper decorum in the house of God, God. Yes? Paul is addressing a situation. Paul is not Paul is not establishing a doctrine. Women across the spectrum forever, throughout the centuries, should not speak in church. No, because of that culture there. And what's happening, Paul saying, I do not permit. I, Paul, would not permit. Because what's happening here, I don't like to see it. Therefore, women, when you get home, ask your husband the clarity that you needed there. Instead of the back and forth in, in church, and that looks very disorderly, when you get home, Ask your husband to provide clarity in that matter to the fact that he's supposed to, he's supposed to be the learned one, be in the, in the word. That's, you know, so ask him. Today, that, might, that doesn't apply um, because we're not in a culture where the men necessarily know more. It's those who avail themselves to the scripture. So you have women who are quite versed in the word of God and probably their husbands knows nothing about the word of God. You see? So Paul was just addressing the the, the, the prevailing culture of his time and it was, did not create a doctrine um, to suggest that women should not speak in church. So I think we, we're quite clear on that. We're running out of time. So let's hasten on. Let us hasten on. Is it true, pastors, that born again Christians cannot sin? That's a very, <laughs> very ticklish question. Is it true that born again Christians cannot sin after the conversion? So is it true that once someone is converted, they cannot sin? Um, 1 John 3.9 seems to back that point, Pastor. So let me read that. 1 John 3.9 says, Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Wow. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Very powerful passage. Pastor Vincent, let, let me start with you. Whoever is born of God cannot sin. So one accept Christ, they have been converted, they can no longer sin. Is it? No. It's not. Well, please help me. Please help me with this. Whosoever passage. is born of God does not commit sin. Now, the word commit in the original language, it stands for practice, the word practice. It, in other words, it's, it's not a part of our life. It's not a continual, it means not a continual process where we sin, we sin, we sin. Yeah, the Bible says if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It happens. Because, as my colleague says, uh, Elder Pastor Enoch says, we live in a world of sin. Yeah? Meaning that the way, I I even our nature, even our nature, yeah? It causes us to sin because that's why we need to be what? Born again. Born of the water and born of the spirit. So it's not that, it's, it's not that we don't sin. It's that our life is not one of continual sinning. It's, it's something that happens. Okay. We don't plan. 
uh, our life is not based on sinning. W we want to live consistent Christian lives, but things happen. Okay, um, Pastor. And, and what the text is saying, Pastor, is that um, when, you, when, when someone loves God and they have been converted to the truth in which they love about God and what God proclaims, they, as my colleague is saying, that they are not practicing sin. So in other words, they will not sin. You will not intentionally go and commit any sin. And that's what the Bible says. He that is born again will not sin or will not practice sin. And that is important for us. Although we are sinful beings, but we try not to practice sin. You would, you would, you would come short now and then. But your, your shortcoming, is, it should not be something that is being practiced. It should be occasionally you, you try your best, but yet still you would, you would come short. And that's where Christ's blood make up for the deficiency. Okay, so uh, quite, <coughs> quite profound um, responses there, which we need to understand. He that is born of God does not sin. Does not, the, the word, the, the operative word would be, does not continue to the sin. Um, because we are, according to the psalmist David, born in sin, sin. and shaped sin. in iniquity. iniquity. Yeah. So, the day you didn't think that you committed a sin and act, you still need to ask God to forgive you. And the reason being, because the ve our very nature is sin. So while we may not be able to identify an act of sin for a particular day, it does not mean that we didn't sin because sin is running through our veins. Yeah. Yes? So you still have to ask God, please forgive me. Even if you say nothing, you can't remember. Did I, did I commit a sin? What, what sin? You cannot put your hands on it. But because sin is running through your veins, because sin is running through our veins, Yes, sin will remain until, Paul says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last room, when this, this mortal shall put an immortality. That's when we can't sin anymore. Right? But Paul, as rightly as was said, is saying, a Christian cannot just, you're planning to sin. No problem. You, no, no, no. Paul said, when you're born again, you, you, you hate sin. You, so you cannot, you cannot just as Sister Malicia, just intentionally, you're planning to sin. No, no. He who is born of God cannot continue to intentionally sin. That is different from someone who is born of God falling into sin. Pastor, you I, still I, I think, make a point. I think where, where it says he cannot sin because he's born of God, basically what he's saying here, he does not remain in sin because he's born of God. His tension is not to remain in sin. Not that he cannot or doesn't sin. He does not remain in sin. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. So we, we coming down. Our time is almost gone. Um, you know, we want to look at passage. We want to look at a passage in Matthew. Um, you know, in, in Matthew 19.24. Can you please share some clarity on, on, on Matthew 19.24? So let me, just, let me just read Matthew 19 and verse 24. So the pastors can share some clarity, Jesus speaking. And again, I say unto you, Jesus speaking, it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Um, you know, will rich people ever be saved? People who have money and wealth and fortune, can they be saved? Yes, Pastor. Rich people can be saved and yeah. will be saved. Okay. Um, if you look at um, in Jesus' time, we had um, Joseph of Arimathea. He was a rich person. Abraham was a rich person. Um, I think it was Zacchaeus. He was a wealthy person. However, in Jesus' um, statement here, or Question regarding this rich man, rich individual it says, and again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than a rich man into the into enter the kingdom of God. Now, the eyes of a needle, um, in some modern Syrian city, a narrow gate, um, is there for for foot passengers at the side of a large gate by which wagons and camels and other beasts of burdens enter the city. And it is known, this now part is known as the, 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 the needle's eye. And this now part, what, what Christ is saying, it, it presents some form of difficulties and some challenge to enter for these animals to enter into the city. So what, what Jesus is saying is that 
for people who, who, who place their trust in wealth um, and make their wealth their God, it, it presents some difficulties and some yeah. challenge for them to be saved because some of them may think that I have all that I need, so I don't need God. I, I work hard for my money, and this is my money, this is my wealth, my assets, but it is God who gives wealth. And it is God who gives strength to gain wealth. And so therefore, everything belongs to God. But some wealthy folk doesn't come to that realization. And so therefore, it is not impossible, but it creates, it, it, is, it is tough, it is difficult for them to be saved. But some wealthy folks will be saved. It's just that they have a challenge before them. And their wealth may, 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 may very well be the challenge that may prevent a lot from being saved. But pastor, wealthy people will be saving God's kingdom. Although there is a challenge with that. Uh, pastor, we take your final comment. Well, well, uh, look, at, look at this. Look at this. In, 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 sense in, in the Jewish culture, to be rich, it meant that uh, you could purchase righteousness with your wealth. And this point, how, how the disciples look at it. So, so when Jesus made that statement to them, they said, wondered, well, what's going on here? Because it was a rich who, who, the leaders who were rich, who were the ones who people looked upon. And the more money you have, you, you can purchase righteousness. So, so, so when, he's, uh, when Jesus made that statement, he said, well, well, you know, if it's so hard for them, then who then can be saved? If the rich can, can't be saved, then what about us? Yeah? But it's true. The rich are very hard. hard to reach. But it's not impossible. But, but thank heaven the text is telling us that it is possible. Praise we God. can reach them. All right. So, um, you know, time flies by so quickly. We have come to the end of another pastor's corner. Today we looked at difficult Bible passages. Uh, we had a few of them. Um, I don't think I saw any from the, the chat. But we invite you um, from time to time you can share with us. And we can we'll feel obliged to ensure that we seek to explain to you the difficulties that, that those, uh, or the challenges that those scriptures bring to you. So God bless you until we meet for another pastor's corner. We um, always invite a friend and let them know that you have been educated, you have been informed on a pastor's corner. God bless you, and we do see you the next time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here at another pastor's corner. We thank you for the presence of Pastor Francois and Vincent, who um, rightly elucidate the, 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 the words to bring clarity to our hearts um, based upon the passages. Bless our, continue to bless our viewers and listeners. And may this pastor's going to serve as a source of encouragement and instruction for many. Until that day, we shall see you face to face. Keep us faithfully pray in Jesus' name. Amen.